Hi, I'm Lindsay Burke and I'm the founder of Lift Child and Family. Welcome back. I want to talk today about bullying. This is one of my favorite topics. It's something I'm so passionate about, not only as a marriage and family therapist, but I have worked as a martial artist for years and years, and this is something that comes up quite a bit. I've had kids come to me through martial arts for private lessons because they've been bullied. I've had hundreds of parents consult with me concerned about their children being bullied at school or um, dealing with some hazing and harassment from school. And so today I want to really get into some of the details and I'm going to share some of my thoughts and opinions as well as some of my experience as a therapist with regards to what bullying means, how it impacts your children, and how we might be able to reframe our thinking about the whole concept in and of itself so that we really can look at some of the solutions to this problem. So right now there's this huge anti-bullying epidemic that if your child is bullied, you know, teachers need to be stopping the bullying and we need to put an end to bullying and we need to end school violence and we need to put a stop to blah, 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 and all this language about bullying as if it's us against the bully, us against this concept. And I think one thing that's really missing from this concept is the fact that um, the nature and the, the behaviors and the feelings that take place in bullying are things that happen inside of all of us. We all have these feelings, we all have these experiences, and whether you would like to admit it or not, we've all been the bully. First, I wanna talk a little bit about what bullying actually is. I wanna break it down a little bit for you. So first of all, bullying is not a noun. A bully is not a person. A child cannot be a bully. A person cannot be a bully. What happens is we like to label people. So we'd like to say, hey, this person is a therapist. I am a therapist. Well, I am a therapist and I act as a therapist and I behave as a therapist sometimes, but I'm not always a therapist. Sometimes I'm a martial arts teacher. Sometimes I'm a sister. Sometimes I'm a daughter. Sometimes I'm our family cook. Sometimes I clean our house. Sometimes I'm a gardener. Sometimes I'm a dog walker. Sometimes I'm a nothing. I just want to sit back and relax and watch a TV show. We like to label ourselves as one thing because it makes it a lot easier for us to conceptualize. But the idea is a person cannot possibly always be a bully. Chances are that child who at some point, or that adult, um, at some point, may have said or done some really nasty or mean things, and that's quite possible. However, that doesn't mean they were like that every minute of their entire day. Chances are that child at some point did something kind and did have some friends and did something for their parent that was loving and did something that was useful and helpful to someone else and did something that was just minding their own business. So chances are, they're not a bully 24 seven. So first I wanna put everything into perspective. We're talking about a human here. I want us to recognize that when we're looking at some of the behaviors that are causing problems and that become scary and frustrating and a challenge for us in our society, I want us to really identify the behaviors and individual issues that are taking place, not the person as a whole. What bullying is, is when someone uses fear or intimidation in order to gain that sense of power and control over something. This is when someone feels scared and they really need that sense of security. So they're really going for whatever it takes for them to feel and to show everyone that they are powerful and strong in order to feel safe. That's ultimately what it is. They need that sense of feeling safe. Now we as humans, as we have joined civilizations and we've become more advanced as a species, we've learned to communicate more effectively. We've learned to share resources. We've learned to negotiate. We've learned to have conversations with one another instead of just brawling it out in the back of an alleyway. <laughs> and I mean, that still happens. What we've learned is instead of constantly fighting for goods and resources, it's been a lot more effective as humans if we work with other humans. And so instead of always fighting over these goods and resources, we share resources. We work together to attain resources. We have conversations and we communicate with one another and we support one another. And as a team, we can ultimately accomplish larger goals and bigger tasks. And we can accomplish a lot more when we work with other humans. However, children don't know this. And even young adults don't know this yet. And their brain is not in that place to be able to always make these negotiations and to have some impulse control. 
when we're feeling anxious and when we're feeling like we're afraid that we're not going to be able to get what we want, whatever that may be, and think about it, if it's a child, it may be getting attention from the teacher or being friends with a certain child in, in the classroom. And if we are afraid that we're not going to be able to attain that without violence, that caveman brain starts to come back in and, and our instinct, our natural instinct is to fight for it. We all possess this and we possess this from birth. And this is not what makes us bad people. This is what makes us human. <laughs> inherently human. The other thing about this concept of fighting for our resources and fighting for what we want and being aggressive is for generations, for the most part, it works. It works. It's successful. Uh, when people, the big guy fights for what he wants, he wins. And so it's also easy to be reinforced and motivated to behave this way in order to gain what we want. And it's a lot easier in certain circumstances to do this than to be able to work with people, to be able to communicate with people, to create alliances. That takes a lot more forethought. It takes a lot more planning. It takes a, lot, a much higher level of emotional intelligence and a much higher level of communication skills to be able to do those things than to just punch a dude and take their stuff. The reason this is still an instinct and it's still a part of our behavior is because we have this little back brain that's still in charge of our fight or flight. And, it, and again, this is what saves our lives in, in really scary circumstances and in really, like if a bear comes out, you want that fight or flight instinct to kick in. This is a really important part of our brain. So we still have that there in order to protect us, in order to advocate for us, and in order to be there on our behalf. But the part of the brain that allows us to participate in civilization is the frontal cortex. This is this big gray part in the front of the brain. If you've ever seen a, a picture of the brain, this is this part. And one thing that's important for us to know is even though it's anatomically fully developed, I mean, you can see that it's pretty large even in babies. It is not fully developed. This part of the brain is not fully developed until we're about 25 years old. And neurologists, correct me if I'm wrong, but for women, it does develop a little sooner between 23 and 25 years old. For men, sometimes it's not fully developed until 30, if that explains anything. <laughs> But this is why young people, even young adults, are still constantly making a lot of really risky decisions because this part of the brain that controls our impulse control, this is the part of the brain that stops that back part of the brain and says, hey, wait a second, I know you're saying that we're really uh, in a lot of trouble here, but I'm gonna stop for a minute and think if there's another way that we might be able to obtain this goal without picking a fight with this really huge dude over here. So when we're looking at why your four-year-old, for example, just walks over, punches his sister in the face, and takes her toy, it's because that part of the brain is not fully developed. That part that's like, I want what I want, and I want it right now, and I'll do what it takes. My sister's not going to give it me, so shh, I'm going to shove her, and I'm going to take it. That part of the brain that says, ah, oh, you know, maybe you could say please, or maybe you could say, oh, I'll find another toy. That part of the brain that's able to negotiate and say, wait a second, eh, 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 let's hold up is not fully functioning. And this, this is why children still need adult supervision. Children still need adult supervision. 17 year olds still need adult supervision. And we all know, even though 18 year olds are considered an adult, 18 to 25 year olds still often do not make very good decisions on their own behalf because of their impulse control. This is why their insurance is still really high because they are risky drivers. Children need supervision because they are not able to inhibit some of those feelings when they're feeling fearful, anxious, or compulsive. Secondly, I cannot fully get into the detrimental effects of labeling a child or any human a bully. Putting any kind of label on someone's forehead is entirely unfair and especially one that's negative because it eventually trickles down into becoming that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. We also teach kids not to label, not to name call. And so it, as adults, if we're talking about our child's friend who was bullying them, like, ah, oh, he's turned into such a bully. We're labeling, we're showing our children that labeling people is okay. So it's our job as adults to set the example and say, you know what, why do you think that person was being so mean to you today? Why do you think she was saying those things that were so hurtful? 
what was going on for her? Oh yeah, you know, yeah, are her parents getting divorced? Oh, she must be really having a hard time with that. Was she feeling alone? Did she have somebody to eat lunch with today? Did that person, um, is she doing okay in school? Is she, is she having a hard time maybe with some of the topics you guys are covering? And showing empathetic language to our children. How do we speak to someone when they are having a hard time? How do we set a boundary while still being loving? Remember as adults how powerful our language is. And we are talking about children here. These are children who have not even been alive as long as you've had your most recent job. <laughs> we have to keep things into perspective that we are talking about six-year-olds and eight-year-olds and even 17-year-olds. They are not even at their full body weight yet. Their brain is not fully developed yet. We've got to give them some slack. I have an awesome friend and colleague and fellow martial artist that I've been working with for the past couple of years who teaches martial arts classes but also does workshops on the concept of anti-bullying since we're using that term. And the whole idea of how do we teach kids to um, confront aggressive behaviors from their peers. And you would think, and what you mostly hear about, are all these self-defense moves that we teach kids. And you would assume that he's teaching these kids how to block and how to punch and how to use their big voice and say no. But the number one thing that he focuses on is empathy training. He gets how important it is for children to understand that this bully, this child who's being aggressive, or this child who's giving them a hard time is a person. It's a whole person. It's not a bad guy like we see in the movies to be assaulted and beat up and shunned and pushed out or sent to jail. This other child is a whole person. And first, in order to reduce conflict, we must first understand and empathize with the problem and typically the problem is fear. So what he teaches these kids is how to set boundaries, and it's really important for us to be able to see the distinction between setting a boundary and rejecting someone. Rejecting someone is letting them know you're not important to me. You don't matter to me, I don't wanna hear what you have to say, no, you can't be in my space, I don't wanna have anything to do with you, go away, you're nothing. Setting a boundary is the opposite. Setting a boundary is respectful and loving. And what you do by setting a boundary is you say, this is how I feel. This is how when you do this, it makes me feel. I want a relationship with you. And these are the conditions in which I can have a relationship with you. Setting a boundary is a conversation. And it's so important for us to teach children how to have this conversation of, hey, I want a relationship with you. I like you. I like spending time with you. I bet you're having a hard time and I wanna be here for you. So my biggest point when it comes to managing the issue of bullying in schools and aggressive behaviors and violent behaviors in children and, and teenagers and even young adults is empathy. It's so important for us to stand to understand and really seek understanding of the root of this issue. What are these children going through? And instead of looking at condemning them and, and looking at sending them to juvenile delinquency programs, and instead of making sure that um, those kids are separated from my kids and my, safe, my kids are safe from those kids, for us to really understand that some of these aggressive behaviors and some of these bullying behaviors and some of these acts are simply acts of fear and acquisition of power and a need to feel included and that all children have these feelings. It's something that as humans, we all experience, we all relate to, we all have in our nature and it's something that we can understand and prevent when we accept that and when we recognize that. So what we as adults can do is understand the root of the issue, what's happening in these homes, what types of services do kids who are acting out need, what type of support do they need, what kind of resources do they need, what type of parent coaching do their parents need, what can we offer these children who are beginning to walk down the road of delinquency, what can we do to, so that they can feel safe in the civil world, so they can stand up for themselves in more appropriate ways and they can seek support and attention and get their needs met in more supportive ways. That's our job as adults. Well, thank you so much 
for your time. I hope that was helpful and answered some of your questions. And if you have any further questions or comments, I'm really excited to hear what you all think about this video. So you can shoot me an email at lift therapycoach at gmail.com. You can also check out my website at liftchildandfamily.com and um, follow me on Twitter at lifttherapy. Follow me on Facebook and I hope to see you next time.